Second Kings, Second Kings. We're going to do something a little different. Normally, you got notes, you got stuff on the screen, and we're not going to do that. We're going to go back to old school today. You know why? Because we can. So we're doing 2 Kings uh, chapter 4. You really got to have your Bible open today because all you're going to get on the screen is uh, 2 Kings chapter 4 verses 1 through 7. Tell me when you're there, just kind of wave at me so I know you're there. All right. You know, sometimes if you look at what you have in life, uh, it seems like you always have more when you really look at the things that you have. Amen? The other side of that is, and, and it's true, is that if you look at what you don't have in life, it seems like you don't ever have enough, right? And so we're going to look at that this morning because I, I think of all of us in this room, at one time in our life, we've probably felt like we've... Uh, you know, we just don't have enough. Our tank is empty. Anybody kind of feel that sometime? Just we're running on fumes. It's just not enough. We, we seem to uh, maybe carry this sense of I'm not all that in my life. I'm inferior. I'm, I'm small. I'm untalented. Uh, uh, kind of have this dark cloud. Some of us in this room, perhaps from, from day one in your childhood, maybe some things happened to you or maybe you didn't have the, the parents that were that supportive or whatever it was, or maybe you weren't picked first in, in the third grade, you know, to play tetherball or whatever that was. And maybe that hurts your feelings and maybe you've carried that around. And so ever since then, that traumatic experience and, uh, you know, you've just sensed that you weren't enough and that you didn't have enough talent or enough uh, intelligence or enough personality. And, and so I think sometimes in this, this thing that we call pandemic lockdown, we have a time to reflect, right? And then we had Snowvid 2021. We had lock up time. You know, we couldn't go anywhere. And during that time, a lot of you flourished in there. Some of you cleaned out closets, didn't you? How many of y'all cleaned out a closet during that time? Yeah, I did. I did kitchen stuff. I did my Tupperware. I organized my Tupperware. Now, I must be really bored for a man to organize Tupperware. <laughs> I did that. And I also, you know, maybe you did long-range planning. Maybe you flourished during this time. This was a good time to kind of stop everything, look at your life, and say, man, I'm going to do this and this, and, you know, vacation planning, maybe some financial planning. Maybe you did that, but some of us might have floundered during that time. And we kind of looked at like uh, like life is in the back seat, like who's driving this train anyway? And maybe you look at your life and say, man, I, there's some things that it's not what it looks like and not what it, I wanted and not what I projected in my life. And so maybe during this time, you... It was kind of a dread time because oftentimes when we don't feel like enough, we fill our life with busyness, right? We get really busy, 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 and then we don't have to deal with maybe some feelings of insignificance or some smallness or I'm not enough in life. A sense of maybe nothingness. I don't have it. I, I, I think I thought about this and, uh, you know, most of us drive cars and we have warning lights. Now, some of you may not know what a warning light is. You ought to think about that, driving a car. It's there for a reason, right? You have warning lights like you're, you're getting low on gas, right? Or maybe the oil light or the temperature gauge or, or whatever. These lights are important that you can't ignore it because if you ignore those lights, what happened? Your car is going to break. It's going to be disastrous. You're going to be headed somewhere, and all of a sudden it doesn't run, right? Because your battery, your alternator has been saying it's not working, it's not working. Okay, finally, it's not going to work. And then you go, oh, that's what that light's for, right? You ever been there? Don't, don't raise your hand. Don't do that. Okay. In life, we have, we have these warning lights sometimes. And, and we can keep going and going and going, and we can fill our lives. But, but, but sometimes, maybe these pandemics, maybe these Snowvid 2021 causes us to stop and reflect. And maybe there's a breakup of relationship or you lose your job and all of a sudden you become a, in panic mode like, all my life means nothing. I've lost my job, my 401k, and I've worked so hard for this and now I have nothing. And we go into panic mode. 
And maybe you've been experiencing this. This is where we find the widow lady in this story. She's in panic mode. She's lost everything in this story. Now let me kind of give you a little bit, and we're going to read this in just a few more moments, but she's, this lady's running on empty, and she has nothing, and, and the way she looks at her life is like it's, it's, it's coming to a, it's, the, the train's been derailed, and it's going to be a major train wreck that's fixed to happen. She's lost her husband. Her husband has died. And back in those days, women did not work outside the home. And once a man died, that meant total disaster. Economics would stop. Income would cease. And all the substance that she once depended on her husband to provide for her family and her sons would now cease. And now she was destitute. It was a suicide note when a husband died in ancient times. There wasn't the income and government set up to take care of those. And so she knew this was the final blow. And you know what the final blow was? That she was going to lose her children, her sons. And back in those days, if you couldn't pay a debt, they would take your children and they would do that as a, as, as a substance of, if you owed some money to someone, they would take them and they would use them as servants. And, and, and that was just the, the normal thing back in those days, you know? Uh, and so, so you got to understand all that she's going through. She's, she's, she not only has been running on empty, but now she's really less than nothing. And yet in this nothingness, we're going to see in this story that she discovers God's perspective of nothing creates an opportunity for something. Something wonderful, something magnus. So it's going to be a, a miracle. And, and, and in a sense that she has nothing, she has nothing left. And then God shows up and says that nothing is something to me. You want to hear the story? Okay, let's look at this. Okay, Second Kings. Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophet cried to Elisha. Elijah was the first prophet. And then he passed the mantle on to Elisha. You got that? Everybody there? All right, cool. So if I say Elijah, y'all know, yeah, he's, yeah, whatever. Uh, your servant, she's talking to him. Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. Uh, you know, I thought about this, and, and, and I think it's true. Life, life doesn't give allowances for your crisis. You know, life just goes on, right? And, and this, this is a person who apparently feared God, it says right there. And that word fear God doesn't mean a, I'm scared. It means that it was a commitment to God, to serve God, respect. It was a, a, a word for respect and honor and commitment and, and yeah, reverence there uh, of God. So he feared God. And so this was a man that, that, that feared God, that served God, and yet he died early. It happens. You know that your servant feared the Lord. But the creditors have come to take my two children to be slaves. And Elijah said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you in your house? She said, your servant has done. Can I stop right there? I use, I use this for my counseling guide. I've used this, this, this example. When people come to me, and if you come to me in crisis, this is the guide that I use right here. And the guide is, is very simple in counseling with people with needs and crisis and, 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 and looking for answers. First of all, that when somebody comes to me, I must consider what they're saying to me and who they are, very important. You can understand who Elisha is. And, say, and we see this in 2 Kings chapter 2 and chapter 3, right before we read this. We see that he's been talking to kings and nobles and rulers and shakers and movers. I mean, this prophet was a guy that was really talking to a lot of influential people here. And then this widow comes and talks. The point is, is that no matter who you are as a counselor, I'm here to be available, Right. And then you see in 2 Kings chapter 5, you know, you see Nahum, y'all know that one. He's, a, he's the commander-in-chief of the Syrian army and he comes of leprosy. You know that story. I mean, this Elisha guy, he really talked to some, some pretty shaker movers out there. And yet this, this seemingly insignificant, this seven-verse lady comes into the picture of the prophet that's leading and speaking to kings. And he spends time with her. So the first thing that I, that I get out of this is that as a counselor, make time for people. And the second thing is ask responsible questions. Do you see the questions that he asked? We're going to look at that a little bit more. The first question he asked her, responsible question, is what do you need? 
you know? The second is, what do you have to help with your need? Do you see that? Those are responsible questions. You know, if you just ask the first, you know, if, 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 as a counselor, if I just simply say, well, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? And I just focus in on that, then there sometimes create a dependency. Do y'all hear this? This is all free, by the way. This isn't in sermon notes, all right? Y'all like free stuff? No. Because I think we all should be counselors and when people have needs. And the first question we ask is, what, what, what do you need? But the second follow-up question is more important, I think just as important. It said, what do you have that will help yourself? All right? And so that creates also an opportunity for them to look in their life to see those things that they really have. Because I believe everybody in this room has something. We really do. We may not feel that way, but we have something. That's where we're going to go in this message. And so we ask this, what do you have that would help yourself? Do you see that? And that's good counseling skills right there. That was free. I'm going to give you my own. Because we're going to be here a while if I don't. Go on. All right. Where, where am I at? Elisha said to her, what, what shall I do for you? And tell me, what do you have in your house? And she says, your servant has what? Say that word. Nothing. nothing. I, I ain't got nothing. That's West Texas talk. I ain't got it. I ain't got nothing. I ain't got doodly squats. What we say in West Texas, really. I ain't got nothing except I got this little jar of oil. Let's go on, Joe. And then he said, Elisha said to her, go outside. Go borrow some vessels from all your neighbors. And then he says what? Empty vessels. We're going to come back to that. Empty vessels. And not too few. In other words, don't just, go out, don't just go out and get one or two empty vessels. Go out and get as many as you can. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Empty vessels. How about full vessels? Why can't I just take full vessels and then that will, be as, that will subsidize my problem? He doesn't say that. Go ahead and get empty vessels. And then when one is full, set it aside. All right. Oh, then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons. Important to all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So she went from him and, and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. Yeah, I, I kind of think the idea here is, is that, you know, she, she went back home, she did the same, but I think she sent her sons out. You know, I kind of get this idea that, and the sons are knocking on the door. You know, can you see that picture there? The sons are coming in and say, what, what do you want? You say, well, do you got any empty vessels? What for? You know, kind of empty Tupperwares? You know, yeah, I got those organized. Anyway, and so empty, you know, and so well, who's this for? My mother. And so they knew that her husband died. and said, oh, sure, son, you can have this. And so they go from door to door and they get these vessels and they go back in and they shut the door. And she went from him, shut the door behind herself and her sons, and she went and poured. But they brought the vessels to her. Verse 6, Joe. When the vessels are full, say full. full. Yeah. She said to her son, bring me another vessel. He says, to her, there's, there's not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. Hmm. She came back to the prophet and told the man of God, he said, go sell the oil, pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. First thing that I want to say to you, if you're taking notes, you might want to write this down. You don't have to, but um, it might help. Check your oil. <laughs> when nothing becomes something, that's the title of the message, when nothing becomes something, we must evaluate what we already have in our possession. Verses 1 and 2. Let's go back to verses 1 and 2, Joe. I love this dialogue between the man of God, Elisha, and this woman. It begins at the start, and the widow has lost everything, and she takes her son, and, and, and the, in lieu of the death, they're going to come get her sons. And, and then Elisha asks her, says, so, so what do you have at your home? Did, did, did y'all hear that? She just told him that she's in debt and she has nothing to pay for her debt. And the last thing that they would do is they'd come take your children away from you and put them in slavery. She's lost it all. And she just told this guy, this man, that she has nothing. And then he asked her, what? So, so what do you have in your house? <laughs> Typical male, right, ladies? I was, are you not listening to me, you know? Are you not, are you, you know, it's a proven fact that women speak double words or tw uh, twice as many words as men. You know what the reason is? Y'all have to repeat yourself 
to us men. I'll let those folks in right there. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, like, uh, she's probably saying, are, are you not listening to me? But I'm, but I'm going to go out on a leap of faith here, okay? All right? I know that's stuck in your mind. Yeah, he never listens to me. I know y'all think that. But, but I want to go on a leap of faith here. I, and, I, and I think he did hear her. And the question really isn't for himself, for information. What, what do you got there, girl? You know, it's really not that. But he's helping her identify that she does have something. So let that soak in. It's not so much that, what do you really got? It's, it's not for his information, but it's for her information. Now here's the point here. The point is, and it's true, think for a moment with you. For this to really work in your life and for you to get the sense of the message here, you've got to internalize this a little bit. Just be honest with yourself. Is it not true sometimes when we go through hardships, we tend to minimize what we have? Think of that for a moment. When we go through hardship, your boss walks in, just play this out. Maybe it's never happened to you, but just play the scenario. Your boss walks in, some, a, a boss that you've invested, a company that you put your life in, you've been trained for this position, your boss walks in and he fires you. Most of the time, our first reaction, now I have nothing. It's all been a waste. And we kind of maximize that, that sense of lostness, and we minimize what we have. We don't immediately go, well, I've got this, 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 and this. But we, we usually tend to go in that direction. Don't you not agree with that? And then we tend to say, I've got nothing. And once we, begin, we buy into this deficit of nothing, we begin to allow these hurt feelings just to kind of take over us. And we become very, very depressed and sad. Because why? I ain't got nothing. It's been taken away. I've got nothing. Now let me explain something here. And I don't want to make a big deal about this, but I, I want to highlight this. Of all the things that they could use is oil. And oil in the Old Testament oftentimes, and we can see this in Psalms chapter 45 verse 7, it said that I anoint you with oil of gladness. And sometimes this word oil represents joy and gladness. Did y'all get that? The oil represents joy and gladness. And so what, what happens a lot of time is Satan often tries to steal your what? Say it with me. He tries to steal your joy, doesn't he? Just try to take it away from him. But guess what? He can't do that. Satan really can't steal the joy that God puts in your life. Now, wait a minute. We just, y'all just said, yeah, he does. He, he makes you think he can, but he really can't. So what happens is this. Watch this now. He begins to deceive you. He begins to convince you that you have nothing, that your life isn't worth it, that you've lost it all in your life. And, and he, can't, he can't take it away, but he can deceive you enough that you give it away. You give that joy away, and you're miserable, and you're sad, and you're depressed because I have nothing. I have nothing. Look at my life. I have nothing. And so we buy into that a lot of time. We feel like we've got nothing. We're used up, and we have nothing to offer. Now, here's what happens. Now, watch this. When we work in this deficit, this sense of, I don't have enough. When we operate in this deficit long enough, we begin to look at the things that we have. We hold them in our hand, and I go, I ain't got nothing. Does that make sense, what I just said? Nobody agreed with me on that. Okay. All right. When we, when, let's go back, maybe something happened in your life. Let me explain it this way. Maybe something happened in your life a long time ago. And, and that brought you to your knees. It brought you to the faith that the plans that you had, the goals that you have, are not going to be achievable. And that's left a mark in your life. And you carry that with you every single day. Just in the back of your mind, well, it's not, probably not going to work out. And you carry that over and over and over. And that deficit of saying, I, I, it's not going to work. It's impossible. It's not going to work out in my life. That deficit, you begin to look at that deficit of saying, it's nothing. And the things that God gives you, you begin, it's not enough. It's not enough. And when you have that not enough deficit, you're sad. It breaks your heart. Does that make sense? You've lost hope. Hope deferred is what? Yeah. 
There it is. So you all getting that now? Does that kind of make sense? I'm not trying to put anything on anybody here, but I'm helping us understand this because when we operate in this long enough, you know, then Satan doesn't steal our joy. We just, we forfeit it. I'll explain that later in, in my personal life. And the truth about this is when we look at this story, the very thing that she calls nothing, that widow says, I have nothing, God uses for a miracle. Now there, we can understand that. The very thing she says, I have nothing. And she looked at that little bit of oil and she still called it nothing. She says, I have nothing except this little oil and that's nothing. God uses what she calls nothing for a miracle. Now I like that part, don't y'all? Yes. All right. I'm trying to preach this the best I can. <laughs> And, and when I look at this, I think, you know, in our new members class, and, and we're, I'm going to let you all know who these folks are. In our new members class last Friday at my house, I, I explained to you all, and I said this, I said, you know, every one of us have these gifts and these callings. And, and we have those gifts and those callings in our life. And, and, and every one of us are different and unique, and God gives us these gifts so that we can be a, a whole church, one body, and these resources, and we all have these, and sometimes we may look at those things and we say, this is so small and so insignificant, right? And it's not. I mean, all through the Bible, we, we see these amazing stories that, that even though it may look small to us, and insignificant to us, it's always the beginning of what God can do. God often uses the small and the insignificant things in our life. Right? There are tons of stories in here. First Kings. Um, First Kings chapter 18 talks about Elijah. Elijah just uh, com had a big blowout with the Baal gods, you remember, and the Baal prophets, and calls down fire and consumes the altar and shows that God is really God. He's an awesome, powerful God. Uh, he will not be mocked and comes down and he, he takes the altar. The fire comes down from heaven and then you see the Baal priest and they're consumed in this fire. And then Elijah and his servant go up to Mount Carmel. That's where they're at anyway. And they kind of go up there and he tells his servant, there's been a drought. He predicted this. And there's been a drought. There's been no rain. The land is dried up. And uh, you remember the story? And then he calls out to his servant and says, Hey, servant, I want you to go up to the top of the hill and I want you to go see what you can see. So the servant runs up to the top of the hill, runs back down, he, and he comes back down. He said, What did you see? He says, I, ain't, I, I got nothing. Hmm. Go do that again, servant. And the servant goes up again for the second time, runs up the hill, comes back down, and looks to the sea. He, he, he looks to the sea to see what he could see. I ain't got nothing. Go do it again, big boy. Yeah. So he does it again, third time, fourth time, fifth time, sixth time, seven. Can you imagine the servant the last uh, six times? Are you kidding me? You've got legs. I've told you there's nothing I can see. There's, there's nothing out there. I've looked. I've done what you asked me to do. Go look again. Seventh time, servant comes back down. He says, okay, all right. there's a cloud out there. And it's insignificant. You've got to squint to see it. It's about the size of a man's hand. But there's a cloud out there. And Elijah said, there it is. Let's go tell them the rain's coming. You know? When we see something so insignificant, so minute, God says, that's enough. And we act on faith to it. Do you think God's not telling us sometimes? And here's it is. I wrote this down. It's not the size of any resource that determines the size of a blessing. Y'all write that down? Y'all write that one down. That's, that's a good statement right there. You want me to say it again? I'll say it real slow for all you shorthanders. It's not the size of any resource that determines the size of the blessing. And there's so many illustrations on this. Think about Moses. You know, he delivered millions of people, right? And what did God use? He used a stick in his hand, right? The Bible says if we give a cup, in, a cup of water in Jesus' name, he blesses that. You remember the little boy that had the poor boy's lunch, you know, some fish and some bread? That, that small, insignificant lunch fed how many people? 2,000 people? 5,000 people? What was it? I don't know. A lot of people, right? Get the gist. What? Five? Five? Yeah. Do y'all want to preach this or what? You know, <laughs> it's just a story. Okay. 
widow lady goes to the temple, drops in two pennies. She says, man, she gave it all. Do y'all see that over and over and over? The Bible's full, full of these stories. And so, you know what, we may, feel, we may feel nothing. We may feel that, and we have every right sometimes maybe to feel that and to look at that. But I'm telling you today, everyone in this room has something, has something. You have callings in your life. You have purpose in your life. You have gifts in your life. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that God does not repent from the calling and the gifts that he gives to every one of you. In other words, God doesn't take them back. God doesn't regret what he gives you. No one can take away from your purpose, your destiny, the gifts that he gives, the talents that he gives you. God has these things for you. So don't allow the enemy to think those are so little, those are insignificant that you never use them. What if the widow would have said, I've got this little oil, it's nothing. Just forget it. What if she had said that? She would have starved to death, and perhaps she would have lost her sons into that debt. And the same is true for us. That's why, you know, the Bible, we, we use that scripture verse, we kind of throw it around, and, and we kind of want to hear that from God. And when we stand before God, which we will one day, and there will be an assessment of our life, which there will be one day, and we want to hear those words, well done, good, and what? Faithful servant, servant. A servant is somebody who gives of themselves. And this lady was in a crossroads here. We see this in this story. And I think I, I want to say the second point here is when, we, when nothing becomes something, we must believe that we have enough. We've got to believe we've got enough. Whatever God gives us, that's enough. Whatever he gives me is enough. That's why we shouldn't compare ourselves with one another, right? Did, did you hear what he said in verse 2? He says, what do you have? Did you notice he didn't say, what do you want? And what do you project? And what is the desires of your heart? Because God wants to just a, just a bless you. He said none of those things. He said, let's start with what you've got. I think that is so important. Because so oftentimes we, we love these sermons, and, and they're true. Some of them, you know, we hear this on, on TV, you know, if, you know, if you, the reason you don't have these blessings, you don't ask, and there, there's some truth to that. But notice what he said. I love this story. He says, you, you know, he didn't say, well, you know, what, do you, what do you really want here? I, you know, he never said, he said, what do you got? Because God always gives us what? Enough. Verses 3 and 4, let's read that. Got 3 and 4 up there? Yeah. Then he said, go outside and borrow some vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels. And don't be sparse with them. Go out and hustle. Go, I mean, go get them, you know? Shake the highways and the byways, yeah. And then go ahead and shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour all these into these vessels. When one is full, set it aside. And that's exactly what she did. You know, our perception of nothing is God's perception of possibility. Do y'all hear that? When we look at something and we say, well, you know, that, that's nothing but God's perception of possibility. Look, we looked at that when we, two weeks ago when we said the creation, remember? When he looked at the creation, it was nothingness, it was void, it was randomness, it was chaoticness. And God looked at that nothingness, that voidness, that randomness, that, me that messiness, and he spoke and he created. And that's the same thing he does in our life, doesn't he? It's the same thing, same principle. When God looks at that, nothing, he looks at that. But don't miss this. There's, what God expects from us is to demonstrate our obedience and our faith. Did y'all see that? He just didn't say, go home and you're blessed. Or just, you know, uh, go, go, go back to your garden and, and, and you got all this fruit and all these vegetables, you can pay off everybody. Didn't do that. He said, you're going to have to do something for this to work. I like that. Here's my observation with this. You know, sometimes we look at the oil as that's the goal, and that's the, that's the highlight, and that's the victory, and the blessing is that's what we want. We're, we're going for the blessing. But I think in this story, I think the emphasis is on vessels, empty vessels. You notice the woman and her sons, these are empty vessels. They, they, they don't have the resources and if they don't have those resources, there's going to be some disastrous things that happen. And notice what the prophet Elisha said. I want you to go out and I want you to get those empty vessels. Now here is a principle. Listen to this. The beginning of every miracle of God is emptiness. And by the way, your emptiness is the only thing God needs 
from you. He doesn't need your resources. He really doesn't. He owns it anyway, right? Right? Yes. And so when we really look at this thing, it's, it's not like, well, well God wants 10% of my income. That, that's not the issue. What God wants is our emptiness before Him. And Jesus told the disciples and those that wanted to follow Him, He said, if any man will come after me, let him what? Deny himself and take up his cross. Empty yourself. And that's what God demands and illustrates in this. Look, look what happened when the, the widows, the son, these empty vessels go out and they get these other vessels, verses 5 and 6. And so they went out and they shut the door behind herself and the sons. And she said, and, and she poured, they brought the vessels to her. Verse 6, Joe. Look at that. When the vessels are full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there's not another vessel, they're all full, Mom. That was a good story right there. And then they'll all stop. They'll all stop. Every vessel was filled. There's a spiritual principle, and you've got to jump about 2,500 years, you know, after that. And it talks about earthen vessels, and, and Paul talks a lot about earthen vessels. I preach a series on vessels. One of my favorite series that I preach on vessels. I've been asked to do that again. Maybe I'll do it again. I haven't done that in 12 years. Huh? Well, thank you. That's why you sit right there by me. Uh, <laughs> um, the principle is this. It's about... Paul understands this ideal of vessels, and he calls us earthen vessels. And in that principle, he, he says in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20, he, he calls it, we are vessels of honor. Uh, vessels of, of honor is, were those vessels that were used in the temple area. And then in Acts chapter 12, uh, he talks about chosen vessels, and those two were vessels that were used in the temple area. But the one common thing about these vessels is and that vessels were just not to put up on a, on a showcase and go, there's a pretty vessel there. It's got color and it's got form and it's, you know. But the vessel was used to be, to be used and to be what? Filled. And so as, as these, these vessels that you and I are, we're identified with these vessels, you understand that we are made to be filled, Right? That's why the Bible says you to be continually what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that we, we're to be filled with the fullness of God. Jesus said that out of your bellies will what? Flow rivers of living water. We're to be full and filled and be poured out. Notice verse 6. This is really huge. And when the vessels are full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, they're, they're all full. Look at that last part right there. Then the oil stopped flowing. The moment the pouring stopped is the moment the oil stopped. Don't miss this now. Did she stop pouring because she ran out of oil? Say no. <laughs> she didn't stop because she ran out of oil. She stopped because she ran out of vessels and they were all full. Oh man, anybody can preach that. I, I mean, that is so obvious right there. Here's, here's my observation. God will always give you enough when you are pouring yourself out. God will always be enough when you looked at something that you said, that is nothing, that's what she called her oil, and it became something, because why? She's being poured out. But the moment she stopped pouring was when the oil stopped. Do y'all hear that? Yeah. I, I think Paul really under, understands this. He says this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 17. He says, I, I am to be poured out as a drink offering. A drink offering uh, is, is mentioned in Leviticus. We see that when, when Jacob's name was, was changed from Jacob to Israel, and it was, a, it was an offering, and so that was a part of the sacrifice to, to God, sacrificial offering to God, a, a, a drink offering, a poured out on the altar. It's just a, a liquid offering. And notice what he said here. Now, 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 this is Paul talking. Now you've got to understand, the, the one after Christ was used the most in the New Testament was who? The Apostle Paul. 
and yet he went through some of the worst hardships that you can imagine. He was shipwrecked twice, he was beaten, he was rejected, he was stoned, he, he was imprisoned. This guy suffered a lot. And here's what he said, I'm being poured out and I'm so miserable. I'm so unhappy with this. I'm so mad at God with, you know what, that isn't what he said in Philippians 2, 17. You know what he said? I'm being, as a drink offering being poured out and I rejoice. And I'm so glad. Are you kidding me? That is so contrary to us. We love to serve when, when things are going well, and we love to give when we have plenty to give. And yet God calls us to do out of that nothingness, that seemingly insignificant, even in our hurt, we're to do this. You know, I've told this story, and we got a lot of new folks here, and you have not heard it. One of my heroes of faith is Johanna Pichel. And she was a lady in my church and when I became a senior pastor in Hillcrest Baptist, and she was like 180 years old. I mean, she was. She, 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 she wore those, the, remember those shoes that had the high heels about this wide, and they were like boots, army boots, and, and I know my first grade teacher wore them. And so she, that's what kind of, anyway. And Johanna would, in her neighborhood, she lived about four blocks from the church. And, and I, I knocked on a lot of doors, but, but she inevitably, when I would knock on a door, they would say, oh, we know one of your church members, Johanna Pichel. She comes by here and she passes out these religious tracts all the time. How do you know Jesus? How can, how can you have eternal life? These are religious tracts. And she'd pass them out. Everywhere she went. I was in the bank one time and, you know, those little tube things you put money in and, and you don't get it back for some reason. I don't ever send that. But anyway, you put money in. And so one of the tubes came back and one of her tracts was there because she always stamped, she had a stamp that said, call if you want to know more information. Johanna Pichel and gave her a phone number. I remember as she became disabled and, and uh, her and, and um, um, her daughter decided that she needed to be into a rest home. And I remember that day driving up to the rest home and thinking, oh man, she's going to be it's going to be ugly because she loved to get out and walk and she was able to do that pretty much and 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 I remember thinking, oh, what am I going to say to her? How am I going to encourage her? You know, and I walked in there, and there's a couple of ladies in there, and a couple of nurses in there. I'm saying, what's going on here? And she, she said, oh, boy, the gal here. I'm so happy to be here. I go, what? She goes, I no longer have to walk the blocks. They're all around me now that I can pass out these tracks. She's my hero. She's my hero. I preached her funeral, and I... It was entitled Be Bold because I have tons of letters. I told you about all my letters in my fold that I have. Half of those are hers. And every time she would write Be Bold in, in bold print and underline it and star it. And, and she, just, she just really encouraged me. But church, you know, what, you know what one of the saddest things in my ministry and talking to people are those that have said, you know, I once was excited about sharing Jesus. I once taught Sunday school classes to young people. I, I once served the church. I once served the Lord. I, I once was a missionary. I once was a pastor. I once, I once, I once. And some of this is some of the saddest things. And some of them share their hurts, their disappointments, their sense of lacking. I, I don't have anything to give anymore. I've been rejected. I've been hurt. I understand that. We came here 25 years ago. I shared a little bit of my testimony the other night. When I came here, I was out of gas. I was running empty. I had enough of church. And um, decided to move to Wimberley. That's a good place to hide out, Wimberley, you know. Nobody knows me here. And except my best friend, one of my best friends. And so we moved here and just to kind of hide out. and. You know, but, but let me say this. I might have been running on empty, but I never doubted my call. Never doubted the giftings God gave. Never doubted that. I knew that was in there. I, I just, it wasn't enough. I lived this sermon. Wasn't enough. Had no intention to preach again. Had no intention to be a pastor again. I, no, that's not true. I, I did want to preach, but I didn't want to be a pastor. I love just walking into a church and then walk out the door and say, yeah, y'all deal with it, you know? Because that's the work. 
And I was doing that in Stephenville, and then I started preaching here at Cypress Creek, and, and I passed by this church every Sunday going to Cypress Creek over here. Not before the big building, the other building. But finally, you know, the pastor became ill. I've told you all the story. The pastor became ill here and uh, uh, s stepped in a couple of Sundays, and then, then he, his health just deteriorated. And uh, said, I'll come for a month. And then they said, would you stay a little longer? Okay, three months. And would you stay a little longer? Okay, six months, you know. I can do this. I got enough in there to do six months. That was 22 years ago, <laughs> you know. A thousand plus sermons. We've baptized dozens of people in this church. You know what, the, you know what it is? It's not me. It's this. It's that what God calls you to do, you can do that. And even though you may not feel like it's enough, it is. It's always enough. But the key is this. Here it is. You've got to stay empty before the Lord because here's what I discovered. I don't want to do this. But I know this, is that if I pour myself out, God always is pouring himself in me. And that's the process. So here's my challenge, and I'm going to close. Will you become a drink offering? I mean, will you today, just a simple prayer, Lord, I'm going to commit myself to you to be poured out into other people's lives. And I know I've, I've, I've kind of devalued maybe or thought these gifts that I have are insignificant. But, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to act on my will. By the way, this is not an emotional commitment. Because you, you, you may not feel that way, but I'm asking for a commitment of your will to say, I'm going to determine to be an, a poured out offering unto the Lord. And tell God today that I'm, I'm willing because I promise you, if you're willing to be a poured out offering, I promise you this, God will continually prove himself that he is always enough in your life. And he's done that with me. Do you understand that? The reason I've been here 22 years is not because I don't have anything else to do. It's not that, you know, I, I need a job. It's because he pours himself into me as I pour myself into you. Do you all see that? And so I challenge you to do that today. Yeah, it's tough. I get that. Because there's a lot of what ifs and, you know, maybe, you know, but, but I, I promise you he will continue to fill you and use you for the kingdom as you commit yourself to him. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's it. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, I, I honestly, I don't get this. And yet I do get this. I don't, I don't understand how you tolerate me when I think it's never enough. And yet you do. But Lord, you, you seem to bring things to surface that I have submerged on my horizon. And you bring it to light and said, I'm faithful and you are faithful. You're generous and you are generous. Because when I've been empty, you've filled me. There are those in this room that, that know that. And God, there, there are those in all of us in this room we have gifts and talents and there's callings in our life and we know that so Lord today I pray that there's a commitment to those that are in this room today to those that are becoming a part of our fellowship today that they'll realize that what they have is enough as we give it to you and Lord, all we can be is empty vessels and yield our lives to you. But when we do that, you'll fill us. And so Lord, I pray there will be a feeling of you today as we submit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. I pray that there will be an overwhelming sense that, that I do have these gifts. I do have these talents. I do have these resources. I do have a house. I have a, a home. I have family. I have a car. I have talent. I, have, I, I can speak to people. I can touch people. I can do these things, Lord. 
so I commit those to you. Lord, heal the hurts that kind of damming up that flowing. Heal the rejection, the scars, the tormentors. Holy Spirit, we ask you just to resolve this issue in our lives today. And then we're set free for the kingdom of God. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And we pray this in Jesus' name we pray together. Amen. Amen. Amen.